Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Catalyst webinar series presented by the Education Committee for the Southern California Section of the PGA of America. The Catalyst webinar series is a bi-weekly educational platform for creating success and change in your club and career. This morning, very pleased and proud to uh, introduce Mr. Scott Bourgeois, Regional Agronomist for American Golf Corporation. Scott is the Regional Agronomist for 31 properties here in Southern California over uh, uh, LA, Orange, Ventura, and Riverside County. Amongst his 31 properties are uh, publics and privates, overseeing the uh, agronomic efforts at all those properties. Scott has been with the company for 23 years. He has an ornamental horticulture degree from the University uh, from Cal Poly uh, uh, San Luis Obispo. Uh, I've personally been with the company for five years, and uh, Scott Bourgeois has been a mentor to me in that time, and uh, very grateful, thankful that he uh, can make time to do this. Uh, and uh, uh, give this presentation this morning. Thank you very much, Scott, and welcome. Hey, thanks, John. I really appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. Good morning, everyone. John invited me about a month ago to speak about anything maintenance-related, and I thought about covering some different types of topics. And at the end of the day, I want to touch upon three different areas. One is the five focus areas. The other is the seven building blocks of product quality. And then third is some suggestions that will make you a more effective leader or manager. I think that all these topics could be of value and will help you with your career and managing your property. So the first area is the five focus areas. Whether you're running a nine-hole golf course or a 54-hole property, there's similar characteristics to all golf courses. I always find it, I'm not sure about you, but it's easier to dissect a bigger problem or a bigger part into smaller pieces and then start dissecting those to figure out where there's opportunities for improvement. This is particularly effective when you're starting a new property as a GM or as a superintendent. You walk in, they throw you the keys, and you're taking a look at this 130, 150-acre property with all these different departments, and you start almost getting overwhelmed, or you could get overwhelmed. And by compartmentalizing things and putting them into nice little buckets, it's much easier to start looking at them in pieces versus as a whole. Um, you know, I share this technique with new superintendents, especially those guys that are just first-time superintendents. And then sometimes when guys are getting a little bit overwhelmed at their properties and they just, the wheels are starting to fall off the wagon, they need to try to find a way to just make it a, make sense and put the puzzle back together. And the five focus areas can help you do that. So one of the keys, though, is setting up some systems and processes and managing each one of these five focus areas. So the first one we have, and you're probably going to be looking at these and you go, well, I sort of know that already, Scott. These are pretty basic concepts. But again, when you take a look and you step back and you say, well, if I can take and break it into five areas, this might help me become a better manager or leader. The first one's the curb appeal. How does the property look? And it describes the look and feel from the street when you first arrive. It's that first impression. It's so critical. It's like when you're buying a house or when you're deciding on if you want to have your wedding there at the property and you're pulling up. And if things are not right, you just sort of get off on the wrong foot. We feel it's important to have good curb appeal. It starts at the entrance with proper signage. It carries through the grounds with a clean parking lot, planting beds, walkways, a good paint job on the clubhouse, and just well-maintained amenities. We also throw the driving range in there. And um, so our goal here is to make it compelling enough and a neat, clean presentation that will hopefully somebody will want to do some business with us, whether it's booking a private event or and then by going out on the course or buying a membership. So on the pr picture you see here, there's actually a couple of them. These are both American golf properties. The one on the left, you know, comes up far short. It's a walkway going into the clubhouse. The superintendent probably thought he was doing something Disney-esque by putting in the color there, but it really leaves you flat. You know, the color is not looking that good. There's no design. He probably went down to Home Depot, grabbed a couple flats of this and that, and then threw it in there and didn't do the right soil prep on the bed. And so this is what you get. It's, it's better than nothing, maybe, but at the end of the day, it doesn't leave you really wanting to go like, wow, that's incredible. Look at that color display. On the right-hand side, that's our Norwood Country Club or golf course, public golf course out in Granada Hills. Superintendent took a little bit more time, had an aesthetic-looking bed. The turf looks all really good. This is just one example of how you can just tweak something and make it just a little bit better by focusing in and improving this, these areas. 
uh, we call it strategic color. We're not going to spread color around all our golf courses on, and, you know, start buying four or 500 flats at a pop and changing it out four times a year. What we want to do is we want to put a little splash of color here and there, make it look great, and uh, this is one of those things that will help. From a GM standpoint, though, what I would recommend is um, bringing a camera with you. You know, we all carry our phones and we take pictures of stuff. Um, if you see something that looks really, really good at a shopping center or at a nice hotel or a restaurant that you go to, take a picture of it and then bring it back to your superintendent. Hopefully then he can then take a look at what you're looking at and that can hopefully raise the bar. So you start making some things look better around your clubhouse. For you to go in there and describe it and just walk up and say, hey, I want to get some color here, it might ha not have the same result as actually showing a picture and helping paint the picture of what you're looking for at your property. The next one is carts. This is the second in the five focus areas. This not only encompasses all the vehicles and how they're maintained, but it also addresses the cart bar and cart staffing and how you stage the vehicles. We want our members and guests to have safe and clean transportation to get them around the course. There's nothing more frustrating for us when the batteries start wearing down or we have mechanical problems and we're getting phone calls to uh, go out and change out a cart. And so it's our obligation to make sure we have a good maintenance program that not only gives a good experience for the guest, but also lets us um, you know, have safe vehicles. We have a really good preventative maintenance program in American Golf. I would, from what I've heard, we probably run the best carp maintenance program in the world, and that's coming from a couple different of uh, people that are in the know. We have a guy named Dennis Rolls who's based out of Texas. does a really great job keeping us on track with warranties and some of our preventative maintenance programs. We also want to have good records for the sake that if somebody does get hurt and they have uh, an attorney, what do we have maintenance record-wise that when we sequester the cart is all the things in place with brake changes and steering adjustments and all those things that the attorneys will start digging into. So we've got a great maintenance program. On the left-hand side, you'll see there that we have the cart maintenance board. It's a detailing board for the Woody or Narrows Golf Course. I find that a lot of time there's not good tracking going on, not only at our properties, I think we do a pretty good job, but at other properties where people just go in and just, they say they're washing carts, but you don't know how often they're being superwashed or detailed. By having a good detailing board there, it creates accountability. You find out how many carts are being washed by each coworker. They have to initial it. And then you can also find out when's the last time that cart was detailed. So this is a good system, a process that you put things like this in place. I find it very beneficial, and then the end result is taking a look at carts like this that are staged properly, nice and clean. They got a little sparkle to them, um, you know, on the right-hand side. As far as course conditions go, this is pretty basic. It's based on expectation level on what we produce. If you've got a golf course that's got a $15 green fee, it's going to be a different expectation level than obviously if somebody's paying $100 to play around in golf. We have high-end country clubs, and we've got entry-level country clubs. We've got them all. What we've done is we've created four different levels from bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. And we have well-defined segmentation standards within each one of these groups that will tell the superintendent it's sort of an agreement between maintenance and operations that we would like to have you mowing the fairways X number of times per week. Uh, we want you to be able to fill divots on the tee box this number of days a week, raking bunkers this number. So what we do is we take a look based on what operations is telling us they need to compete in that area, and we'll create a maintenance plan and a schedule to create that it's that recipe that they're they're looking for, and now it's our job as a maintenance team to go ahead and deliver that. So we have to be at least equal, if not better, than our competition, and having some good standards there helps get us in on that track. The next one is the maintenance building. Um, it's really the hub of all our maintenance activities. You can see on the left-hand side a picture. That's a course that we acquired a few years ago. And if you walk in there, how does anybody work? I mean, a mechanic's going to be standing in front of that workbench for eight hours, and he's going to be looking for tools, and it's just not very professional. And I have a feeling the whole operation, as a matter of fact, I knew the whole operation was run like that. It's pretty indicative when you walk into a shop on how things are going to be maintained and how tight the operation is. On the right-hand side, the picture of our Skylinks maintenance building. That's in Long Beach. Very clean. The floors are painted. All the We have areas marked off where equipment goes. All the rakes are hung properly in the right category, so it's not a combo of rakes and shovels and brooms all mixed together. You go to Skylinks maintenance building, and we'll even be happy to show you around if you want to show up one day. We can arrange it with the superintendent. 
take a look at how neat and clean that place is. We call it the 5S, and it was based on some different types of lean management and just ways of getting around really efficiently where we're storing things and nice and neat and clean. But the most important thing is when our coworkers come in in the morning, they're probably clocking in at 4.30 or 5. They start their day there. They might come back mid between lunch and um, when they clock in to change out some tools. And then you have lunch there and then maybe t another trip back to the shop in the afternoon portion and then before they go home. All of our activities radiate out of the maintenance building. And I think American Golf does an incredible job maintaining most of our facilities to the, the, a really high level. I've been to a lot of our competitors and they don't take that same, I guess, pride of ownership and keep clean facilities like this. We occasionally get off track, things get busy, you get into airification, overseeding, maybe a superintendent is starting to get a little wobbly and they dip, but then we bring them right back up. I saw that happen yesterday at one of the facilities I was at, and within one week we'll be perfectly clean and nice and neat and get everything reset out there. The last category is the, oh, here's another one for maintenance building. Here's the superintendent's office at Marbella Country Club, and then on the uh, right-hand side is just how he organizes all his pipe fittings. If you're going to go in there and you're looking for a three-quarter inch slip elbow, everything's labeled, the irrigator knows, it sets the standard, and everything is so tight at that shop, it gives you a sense of just being a really well-run operation. The last one is coworker satisfaction of the five focus areas. The coworkers are so important to our business. We really want to take care of those guys, and a good team of coworkers will either make or break us. So the superintendents can lead and manage their teams, and we want to be able to provide them a good working environment that hopefully will have a happier crew that wants to give us 100% when they get out there and start working. So here you can see there's a shop that we're offering, drinking water, uh, something that's very simple, common sense, but yeah, we ought to offer good water rather than going out to the hose. Uh, this other one on the right-hand side is Mountain Gate Country Club. They offer vending machines with really reduced prices of snacks. I think it covers our cost and maybe we even subsidize it to some degree so coworkers can get things that are reasonably priced and they don't have to go up to the clubhouse and try to order anything from the snack bar. On the left hand side is a good way of um, talking about safety. We want to have safety uh, first on all of our properties. Are we providing all the safety glasses, hard hats, eye protection, um, hearing protection, dust mask. We've got first aid kits there. Coworkers need to know that we want a safe operation and they have to operate safe. It's the right thing to do as a business, and we stress that. It's one of our uh, really most important tenets is the way we operate. On the left-hand side, here's a cool little technique that they did. Uh, they ended up by putting the names on the guy's locker. If you want to personalize it, how much did each one of those plaques cost? They were probably three to five bucks, I'm guessing. But does that coworker now feel important when he walks in and he puts his, his clothing away? He's got a place to store his golf clubs if he plays golf. I think it's just those nice little touches that we, you know, try to strive for in, in um, coworker satisfaction. Right-hand side up top is here we got a seat. When you go out there as a general manager, why don't you take a look at all the seats on your equipment? If they're parking the vehicles inside, you're probably going to be seeing seats that are in better condition. If they're not and they're parked outside, they're probably going to be cracked and ripped. We want to have good seats for all of our coworkers, especially if they're going to be sitting on it for eight hours. The last thing we want a guy doing is getting on a wet foam seat that had dew on it and it's absorbing in his pants and then he's sitting in a, a wet foamy seat for a few hours. That's not what we want for our coworkers. On the left hand side, here's a cool little board game, again tied to coworker satisfaction. That you know, if you see something going on out there with the coworkers that are doing a really great job and you say, Well, you know what, I'm gonna you went above and beyond, I'm gonna let you roll the dice today. So you bring all the crew around, and then they're going to go ahead and roll the dice. So let's say if they were on hole number four and they roll a six, they go to hole number ten. Well, hole number ten might be a couple hours off with pay. It could be free lunch for, you know, himself. It could be a hat or a shirt from the pro shop. It's just a fun way of drawing and making a, a work environment better for the teams. Here, this is a little custom recorder that sort of wraps it all up. You can probably find this online from the National Golf Foundation. But as you start and finish a round of a public golf course or a public or private, you can go out there and start looking at all the little touch points that a golfer is going to be seeing or a member is going to see. This might help you drill down and also create some better programs and systems that will make your operation better. As far as the seven building blocks of product quality, 
You know, I asked the question, and I'm sure you guys have thought about it too, if you've had super, multiple superintendents working for you, is why are some superintendents great while others just struggle? I've had guys that are working for us that are almost rocket scientists. They could write books on agronomy, but they couldn't maintain a golf course to save their lives. We've got other guys who um, English is a second language. They're hardworking guys. They've been loyal coworkers, but they're some of our best superintendents. So really what differentiates those two guys or those two different types of superintendents? And we have everything in between, and it really comes down to some of the systems and processes and really the building blocks on creating product quality. You know, you have um, some superintendents where we have to sometimes make a change, and we have a budget, let's say, of $500,000 and a 10-man crew, and they're struggling there, and they're telling us, I don't have enough labor, I don't have enough labor, I can't get it done. I, a lot of different reasons. You hire the new guy, he comes in, and all of a sudden things get better, and you're going, why? How does that happen? It's the exact same amount of money we're giving them. It's the same budget, it's the same team. The only thing that we did was change the leader, and it really does come down to the building blocks. So the first one is hiring smart. It's the old adage, you know, people are your most important asset. It turns out it's wrong. Really, people are not your most important asset. The right ones are. And I think sometimes we settle for the warm body syndrome. You're short, you know, on people, and you need gut bodies, you need guys to come in and help mow, and you'll almost take anybody that comes in through the maintenance door and you throw them an application. If they pass the test, then you hire them up. Uh, we really need to be more diligent and find great coworkers that want to work with us, and it's not easy. You got to go through a multi-approach process to find the talent, and um, eventually you're going to have the team, hopefully, that you're going to be looking through for and with this tight labor market and the unemployment rate going down, you have to maybe get more creative and start looking at part-time people, um, seniors, veterans. Uh, there's a lot of different places where you can go to find people that instead of just thinking about the coworker that's going to come in and work for 40 hours. Uh, there's a lot of other ways of going out there and finding them. We created a recruiting guide, and we passed that out to all of our superintendents and general managers last year. I touched upon a lot of different best practices on how to go out there and find people, how to post an ad on Indeed or ZipRecruiter, how to go out there to uh, drive the community with small business cards or recruiting cards. You can hand them out and say, hey, I saw you working. Are you interested in coming and work for us? There's things that you can do, and it's not just sitting back waiting for somebody to come walking through your door. you got to be aggressive on that. The first, um, you know, you hire a good coworker, then you have to go ahead and you have to train them. An untrained teammate will feel incompetent. They can't perform the job task to their satisfaction or our satisfaction. And I think back when I was hired back with American Golf in 1994, here I've got a college degree. I've worked in landscaping for six years, done high-end commercial maintenance, and the superintendent told me to go rake bunkers or edge bunkers. Well, I've never done that before. I can do a lot of different things, but nobody's ever, first time I've ever been on a golf course. So he sends me out there with an edger and no idea what I'm doing, and I felt like, what am I supposed to be doing? I want to do a good job. It's my first day on the on on at work, and nobody really gave me the training, and that really stuck with me. And I think our superintendents have to take that same mindset because we've been in the industry now for so many years. A lot of us that we almost take it that somebody already knows how to do things. We've got to really take a step back and realize that they're going to be newbies, and they don't have that same level and mindset that you know, we do after working in the industry for so many years. We have a program with American Golf. It's called the Hourly Skills Training. It was developed by superintendents, hopefully four superintendents to train. It's an outstanding program, and it really gives them the basics on going in and doing different job tasks. So that's a powerful program that we use. You know, there's things that happen when you're getting a new coworker on staff. How do you do things really efficiently? It could be routing of a mower. You say, well, go out there and mow the greens. And this guy might have had already golf experience working on a golf course triplexing. But how do you really get around your golf course to avoid noise? Uh, maybe there's a couple homeowners out there complaining. How do you go out there and efficiently mow so you're getting the job task done in four hours versus four and a half or four hours and 45 minutes? There's certain routing through a course that's really more efficient, and that's the kind of training that needs to take place. You can also see it when training is not taking place. It's the leaning flagpole that could be tee markers out of alignment. It's the banana mowing patterns bunkers that have got the sand pulled out by the mechanical bunker rake, and just failing to extend even common basic courtesies to our guests and members by waving and smiling. 
those are all things that we need to be able to teach and train on before a coworker goes out and starts uh, performing, um, you know, work with us. The thing that happens though, when superintendents are feeling the pressure and there may be two or three guys down and the product quality is slipping and they can't keep up with the mowing frequencies and the maintenance, their first inclination is to go ahead and skip the training and just throw bodies out there. That's the wrong approach. There's nothing more important than we should be doing than training. It's the centerpiece of our plan and we have to start building our activities around it. After the individual is trained, it's going to pay big dividends. We have superintendent onboarding with American Golf. We have an assistant superintendent advancement program where we're trying to take the up-and-comers, guys who are good assistants with us, and we put them through about a seven, eight-month program where they have calls every two weeks, and they give them homework assignments and reading assignments. We also launched a coworker development program last year, which was about eight months. Once a month meetings, we got the coworkers together in the region, and we gave them some really great training. We want our people to feel like they're not just hired hands, they're, they're actually they've got a brain, and that they have a lot to contribute to our properties and our success. So after you got the right coworkers hired and trained, then you have to schedule them. This is where some superintendents try to wing it, especially um, I've seen outside of the company, and they just don't know what's available to them. We have what we call a weekly workforce planner. It should be filled out weekly, Friday hopefully, definitely by Monday morning when the first uh, coworker clocks in. But it's a look, way of looking at your priority list and then trying to figure out how to schedule things in based on the amount of crew you have. It's a computer-based program relatively simple, but it takes all the tasks, you schedule everything you want to get done for the week, and then you have to assign each task to each coworker for each day of the week. Now things change, that's what I always hear, well, by Monday or Tuesday things have changed. Yeah, you make a small adjustment, but when you're spending the kind of money we're spending, let's say if you have a 10-man crew and you're paying 11 bucks an hour with labor bird, and you're probably spending 5000 to $5,500 a week, and if the superintendent can't take 45 minutes or 30 minutes to schedule out $5,500 in labor at the very minimum for a 10-man crew, I don't know what else he's doing with his time that could be more important than that. So it's really important to us. We feel like it's uh, our obligation to stretch those dollars. And if you were the superintendent or the owner of that course and you were writing payroll on Thursday night for Friday, I'm pretty darn sure that they want the dollars stretched as far as they can and that we don't have uh, coworkers not being 100% productive. After scheduling, we have to do the performance management techniques. We have something that we call TGIM, which is thank goodness it's Monday. It's a collection of best practices that were created, of uh, the different ways of going out there and keeping your team turbocharged, showing thanks and appreciation. I find that when I ask the question, so what are you doing for employee recognition or management, they usually say, well, I do a carne asada. Well, the problem with the carne asada is it's not enough, and chances are the lazy guy on the crew is eating just as much, if not more, than the hardest working A player on your team. So you have to come up with programs to try to differentiate and reward the coworkers that are going above and beyond. And there's lots of different ways of doing that. You can put stickers on hard hats, like a, almost like a football player, and each sticker could represent some kind of great act. You can do the handwritten notes on back of paychecks thanking the coworker for doing an incredible job. He's going to hopefully bring that home and show his family. You can like that roll the dice game. Some guys will put gardens in their maintenance building where the guys tend to gardens with you know onions and peppers and tomatoes, and they enjoy that. Foosball, horseshoe pits, a little chipping area back by the shop. Create a better working environment, and by using performance management techniques, there are tons of them out there. You can even research them online. You'll find that it becomes a better, fun, more fun work environment. We have the segmentation standards for American Golf. Uh, we've talked about those. I won't go into them too much more than that, but it's really setting the expectation level and um, you have to know what your competition's like, how you're trying to compete, and then you got to tell the superintendent what you're looking for, and then you got to set a standard, and then you can measure his success and your success to those standards because otherwise it's just you know guys going out there and maintaining things, and you don't know if you reach the goal or not. But by having a well-defined standard, I think it gives everybody peace of mind on what we're what everybody's agreeing to. We have a you know, measurement tool uh, with our company. It's called the SUV or a structured unit visit. It's being done twice a year, and it's uh, one of those things where the superintendent passes if he has an 85% average. We look at everything from bu bunker sand depths to green speeds to if the fire extinguishers have been serviced in the last year the band-aids in the first aid kit. It's a really comprehensive, full-blown inspection. 
And what happens is you have to inspect what you expect and measure to get those kind of results. That's what gets done, is what you measure. Throughout the SUV process, the general managers are supposed to be going out and doing weekly inspections or audits with our superintendents, and it gives them a chance to go out there and take a look at it and have conversations about quality. So that's what we have. And then the last component of building blocks is uh, agronomy. Our superintendents are being hired. We don't teach the agronomy portion. We could supplement it through some training, like we had one a couple weeks ago or last week from Bear Chemical, and they went into some different types of chemical programs. A lot of times the guys will go out there and find their own education, but they really need to come to the table prepared to be able to grow grass and understand things from compaction to salt management to putting together a good fertility program based on what the budget is. And so they need to, uh, that's gotta be, they gotta be coming to the table with that. Some tips that will make you a more successful or effective GM. Um, you know, I started thinking about if I was on the other side, on the operation side, and what would help me manage something that I might not know a lot about. I know what right looks like. I know quality. I think I've got a good superintendent working with me. I'm not 100% sure, but what, what could I do? What kind of tips can I take to make me even more effective? So I'll go through a few of those. Weekly course inspection with your superintendent. Part of our SUV that I just mentioned is asking that question, are you having a weekly inspection with our, your superintendent? And I asked to see the weekly inspection reports because it is a written quick little three-hole type deal or if you want to go out and do more, you can. But you're going out there and you're checking green speeds. You're going out there maybe taking a look at the depth of the rough, uh, how are the bathrooms on the course, and you're driving around. I find, though, that it seems to be a chore or this this activity gets missed an awful lot. I don't know how it is outside of American golf, but I can't think of a more important time to be spending with your superintendent where you're getting out of the office. And typically the reason is I, I hear, well, I see my superintendent every day or I see my general manager every day. I check in with them. It's a totally different experience when you're out there driving, looking at things, bringing a putter, rolling a few golf balls, seeing how the greens are rolling, talking to some guests and members. That when you're out there doing that with them, it's, it's such good quality bonding time, and by spending a half an hour to an hour per week, maybe you set it as a setting time, like I have my weekly department head meetings, and then I'm going to go out right after that for a quick half an hour or 45 minute to hour visit with my superintendent, and just go walk three holes. Instead of getting in a golf cart and trying to drive all 18, just start walking. Not only will you get exercise, but you'll be able to see it from the golfer's perspective. And it's been, um, I find it just to be a great, when I was a superintendent, a great bonding time where you're going to get out there and just get away from the ringing phones and just look at the quality. That's what we're selling on most of our facilities, a good quality golf course that's highly maintained or manicured. And you can start pointing things out. And when you see the weeds underneath your feet or you're standing in a bunker and there's just not enough sand depth or there's some rock in there, native soil showing, it gives you a chance to really start talking about it versus being in the office. Require a weekly labor schedule. I told you about our weekly workforce planner. If I was a general manager, I'd want to have that labor scheduler filled out, and you probably your course doesn't probably have anything like we have, but there's no reason why that they can't give you something that will show how that 10-man or 20-man crew is going to spend their time that week. And I'd ask the superintendent to highlight things that they're going to do that's above and beyond to make my golf course better, though I can drive revenue. And you can take a look at little things that were on people's priorities list. I mean, there's lots of lists out there from landlords to GMs to superintendents to uh, board members to you, you name it. There's tons of people that have got things that they want to get done on the golf course. Well, how do you take that list? and figure out how you start incorporating a few projects per week into the maintenance program. So by having this crew, the crew completely scheduled out and you're highlighting different projects that are going to be worked on, I think it gives you peace of mind and it's a good discussion point with the superintendent. It's like, well, why are you working on that? That's so low priority. I don't really care about you, you know, you know, trimming some bushes out there by that guy's house. That's, that's low, low priority. I need you to fix this bunker on number... Uh, three, because it's continually filling up with water and we're getting lots of complaints on it. So those are the kind of things that it helps you drive the discussion. 
I request a list of the completed tasks from the previous week. So if you take this program and this approach of having people give you a list of what they were planning on doing, well, the following week, once you take a look at what they actually did accomplish, it gives the superintendent a chance to honk his own horn if he's doing a great job. Because a lot of times, we're the unsung heroes out there doing a lot of things and nobody even knows how, all the great things that we're accomplishing. It could be, well, I just went in there and, um, you know, fixed and did this, I did that, I, I fixed this bunker for you, I ended up by installing some drain lines out on number six, I uh, rototilled all the bunkers to make the sand quality better, you name it, but it gives the superintendent a chance to actually show you what he's done, and if he comes back the following week and there's nothing done, when he said, and you're comparing it to the original list, like what happened, how did this whole thing fall apart on us, you didn't do anything you had talked about doing. So this is just one of those things, again, by probing in a really benign way, you can get some ideas of what's being accomplished without having to feel like you're asking all the time. You're, because you're just setting the expectation. Every Monday morning by 9 o'clock, I want the upcoming schedule, all the upcoming projects, and I want to see what you did last week. And it's not like you're trying to be a micromanager. It's just you're trying to manage your business. Require a 30, 60, 90 day calendar. A lot of times there's these lists that we put together that get really, really long. And you know, it might be like, I can't get to that for another 90 days, or it might be, I'm not ever planning on getting to that, and I might as well tell you it right, right now. Or if you want all these things done, why don't we start talking about adding another three or four guys to my crew or contracting some things out. And by taking a look at your labor scheduler and trying to compare that to what the priority list is, you can start building out the calendar, but then you can start also giving people straight answers, whether it's a landlord or a member and say, I'm going to go ahead and take care of that, but it might be in the month of July or August, or I think we can get that to tear, take care of that in the fall. So the 30, 60, 90 day calendar is really helpful. A prioritized list of projects, asking them to put the list together, one through whatever. I can go to a golf course, and I tell this story probably every time I go to a property so I don't hurt people's feelings. Is Let's go ahead, and I can probably find 200 things wrong with your golf course just by walking around. And, you know, I can go to a, co a course that's hosting a tournament and find tons of things that are still wrong. So with our properties, is we have to take a look at the priority of the list. How do we sort of mesh all these together and then create the, the master list of what we want to prioritize? And by you working with your superintendent and putting it as a one, two, three, four, five, and having to force rank these, you'll hopefully be able to start knocking out the highest priority things, and you've got some say and control in the matter. Check out the competition at least two times per year. Very important to go out there. Uh, when I was a superintendent, uh, it happened a few times. And you're there, and you're looking at a guy down the street whose golf course had some characteristics to it that he was doing something better than I was. And it made me sort of step back and say, you know, i got to pick up my game on planting better clubhouse color. That guy, it was like Disneyland light over there. So it raises the bar. I think it puts the superintendent in a situation where we've done this too. Sometimes where we hear about these really high-end clubs, and we'll go over there and check it out with the GM and superintendent. We'll go back and say, well, if we're actually better than those guys. It gives you a chance to compare. But until you get out there and actually make the visit, you don't have to go out and play 18 holes. You don't have to go out. You can walk around the clubhouse, maybe ask for a little drive-through, check some things out, or maybe you go out and play you know, a little bit of golf. But you know, checking them out twice a year is, I think, really key especially if we're trying to sell out some of our public golf courses and our guests have so many different options out there. we got to make sure we're, we're competitive. Ask for a force ranking of all the maintenance staff. So this is the old Jack Wells GE technique where you list all your coworkers, and if you have a 10-man crew, obviously it's 1 through 10, and you're trying to identify the bottom 10 or 20%. Well, on those bottom 10 or 20%, what are you doing to either manage them up so they're no longer at that bottom, or how, what are you doing to manage them out? I have a feeling that we have a number of people on all, everybody on this call has a number of people that have sort of going through the motions. They don't have that little skip in their step anymore. They're not grinding it out. They don't really feel like they want to work that hard. They feel like they're being underpaid and overworked. Well, how do you take these folks and either try to motivate them, train them, get them to the where they need to be, highly productive individuals on the team, or how do we manage them out? But asking for a force ranking it gives you a chance to have some discussion with your superintendent versus just saying, well, how's your team? Oh, everything's good. i got a couple guys that just are okay. It, it forces them to actually rank them, and then you're having a specific discussion, a very detailed discussion with them based on who's at the bottom of your list. Stop by the maintenance building and announce a starting time with a box of donuts to see how the things are running. 
most general managers and operations folks don't want to get down to the shop at 4.30 or 5 or 5.30. Nothing wrong with doing it once a month. Popping in, just unannounced, and saying, hey, guys, I just want to see how things are going. Well, is your superintendent there in the morning? Is he the kind of guy that's showing up late, rolling in at 8, and maybe leaving early? Or maybe he's the guy that gets in late and stays late? American golf standards, the superintendent has to be there 15 minutes before the crew starts, open up the door, possibly get the coffee started, making sure everything's all set, and greet the crew as they're coming in the, in the door. And there's a lot of decisions that have to be made first thing in the morning, and the superintendent should be there to be a part of that, whether it's an irrigation break, spraying greens, a couple coworkers didn't show up, and hopefully you have a good assistant out there. But by being having the superintendent there in the morning, but for you to get there, it gives you sort of a chance to spot check things. How's the crew looking? Say hi to them in the morning. You bring them a fresh box of donuts and send everybody out with a donut. You'll be loved, and it gives you a chance to be a part of the team down there. Ask the superintendent to create some communication pieces on an as-needed basis about course conditions. You might be doing an upcoming project. You could be doing overseeding, verification, anything that you're doing out there. Maybe it's a quick little email blast out to some of the key members, the clubs. Uh, the men's club, the seniors club, the women's club, you're sending some stuff out letting them know they're important customers of ours and maybe letting them stay in the loop a little bit more will hopefully avoid any speculation about things and give them some information so they feel like they're a part and they've got the insight. Maintain a personal uh, working relationship with the superintendent. This is sort of a tough one and this was taught to me many years ago when I was in the landscaping business. I was really close to uh, the team and I was right underneath the owner and we had about 25 to 30 guys. And I used to eat lunch with them. I used to work with the guys in the trenches. And I used to do a lot of the physical work with them. And you start bonding with the crew. Well, he felt that there was it's a fine line to walk between being so comfortable and getting cozy with them where they're inviting you to the weddings. They're inviting you to the quinceaneras. They're doing all that stuff that maybe there's not that, that, that fine line where you're crossing over to actually being friends with them. So my, my advice on this is maintain a working, professional working relationship with the superintendents. You want to be nice. You want to be friendly. You want to have you know, you know, lunch with them. That's, that's totally fine. But I think sometimes it can cross the line where you start doing so many things, and then you're going on vacation with them, or you're, going, you're, you're hanging out an awful lot. I think it, 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 it sort of gets blurry. Uh, is it a friendship? Is it a working, professional working relationship? And I think if you can keep that line drawn to some degree, it will pay dividends in the long run. Spot check safety and training records. This is very important, especially when there's accidents. Make sure safety meetings are taking place. Just check their safety logs and then make sure the records are being turned into the Department of Pesticide Regulation. Anything related to safety training, regulatory reporting, occasionally go out there. We've got a system set up for us with our SUVs where we look at all those things and it's part of our inspections that we do twice a year. Drive the course and hand out snacks and our beverages to the crew once a month. Well, what an awesome feeling that would be. It's a hot summer day and you're driving around in the afternoon giving out Gatorades or ice cream bars and you're saying thanks to the crew for doing a great job. It gives you a chance to go out there and spend a little bit of time with them, shake their hands, and give them you know, uh, just something that they're going to say, well, that's, that's really awesome. It's, it's, it's hot out and the general manager is taking the time to drive around. It pays big dividends. I was out with Robin Shelton a couple days ago at Seacliff Country Club, and we were checking out something on the course, and every crew that came by, he'd, he walked up to him and he fist bumped him, and big smile, everybody loved it, everybody's, you know, it, just that interaction with your team, it shows that the top guy at the course, the general manager, is taking the time to go out of his way to shake my hand or give me a fist bump and smile. So I'm just giving that advice, very inexpensive, you do it occasionally, it pays huge dividends. Require a clean and organized shop. I've already touched upon that. That's a no-brainer. You run that shop super clean, and that sets the standard. A shop can be cleaned up. If you have the dirtiest shop in Southern California right now, I guarantee you that place could look a heck of a lot better if he started throwing things away within probably three to four days. But it needs to come from you, and if the superintendent's been there for a long time and he's sort of a hoarder, then that stuff, they just don't want to throw anything away, and mechanics have a tendency to be that way too you got to say, if you haven't used it in six months to a year, it's going. Um, we're junking it. We're disposing of it. We're, gotta, we're gonna have a really clean hospital type operation. 
and then continual improvement, just continuing to challenge your superintendent to come up with new creative ways and addressing high visibility areas and impactful projects. You might have some little pet project you want to get done, and you keep hearing, I, can't, I don't have enough bodies, I don't have enough labor. Well, then how do we go ahead and maybe mow fairways twice this week instead of three times? Maybe we are going to rake our bunkers five times this week versus seven. Maybe we're going to mow our tee boxes twice instead of three times. How am I going to pool labor together because I really want to have this project done? So it's that continual improvement, throwing out some little types of things that are going to push beyond regular maintenance, and sometimes we call it pushing the envelope, riding the risk curve, where you're going to maybe take a step back or two for a couple of weeks in conditioning, but then you'll get caught right back up. But the end benefit is you've had a better They've added a new project, something that's high visibility that people will appreciate. So, John, that's about, and everybody, that's about what I have. I thank you very much for letting me come in and speak to you for about 45 minutes. I think I came pretty close to the target. And um, if I can uh, be of any assistance in the future, by all means, give me a call. You can look me up, and I'm here to help. Thank you very much, Scott, for the, uh, for the time and the presentation. A couple of questions that have come in here. In terms of uh, uh, leadership and delegating, uh, can you touch on a little bit of what separates, um, you know, obviously when you have bigger properties with bigger crews, there's more of an emphasis on leadership and delegation, and then of course there's more of a hands-on uh, requirement for the smaller properties with the smaller crews. Can you uh, 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 touch on, on that in terms of um, how much that that uh, needs to be in terms of the smaller properties? Yeah, you find varying uh, levels. Some superintendents are a real, uh, they want to do every single thing themselves, and they don't want to delegate tasks out. And on the really small crews that have been around for a while, that is okay because they might only have five, six, seven guys. When you get into the bigger clubs and some of our country clubs, the assistant superintendents need to be developed. That second or third person needs to be given some responsibilities and the superintendent needs to delegate those tasks out. And it could be something that they feel like they can take ownership on a special project, a special task, a special activity. It might be, okay, you're going to be running the cart barn, and I'm going to have you oversee everything in carts. That's the cart mechanic, cart detailing, cart cleanliness. And the su assistant superintendent at that point feels like, well, I've got something there I can sort of buff my nails on my chest and say, hey, I've done this. Look how good this looks. And it gives them something to talk about, too, when they – are going to hopefully be able to apply for a job higher up as a superintendent with us or outside of the company or at some other property. So it's, it's, it's important for the superintendents to have his fingers on all parts of the business to some degree, but I think delegating many of our assistant superintendents would feel like if they were just being used as grunt labor out there and uh, aren't giving any specific tasks to take ownership of, they would probably feel like it's not the best place to work. I think we've done a pretty good job of that within our company. And again, there's, we have varying levels from really entry level, small crews up to high end. So those are, uh, we've got a little bit of a mix of everything in between there. I don't know if that answered the question, but. Yeah, it does. I, uh, you know, it does. The, uh, also, um, you touched on the four levels, uh, gold, platinum, um, silver, uh, et cetera. Can you uh, explain the criteria separating the uh, the differences and examples? Right. We have really detailed specifications from green speeds to how often we're going to be mowing tee boxes to how often we're going to mow fairways and change cups. And all those standards are set not only in season when we're in a grass growing mode, but out of season because we're not going to go out there and mow fairways three times a week on dormant Bermuda grass. So these are for in season standards. So what we do is we take a look at what that golf course needs at that price point and what are the what are the guests and members expecting for value. And if you're paying for an $18 greens fee and you're just out there just to have fun, hit the ball around, get some exercise, and you just want a really reasonable, clean golf course, we're going to probably end up by putting you in at that bronze level. And the bronze level will be probably mowing throwaways twice a week and tee boxes twice a week. And we're going to give you some really great greens. Out of all the levels of our golf courses, we don't cut back any levels on greens maintenance or management. The bronze will have the same resources as the platinum course, and we feel like that should be at those high standards. Now, at the platinum, we're going to probably want our greens rolling, you know, at 11 and a half, uh, 11 to 12. And at a bronze course, we'll be happy to have them rolling somewhere around that 
maybe eight and a half to nine and a half range because the golfer that's coming out there to pay that little amount of money is looking for a different experience than the person that's paying thirty-five or forty thousand dollars for a membership, a thousand bucks a month, or a hundred dollar green fee. So we just have to calibrate that and figure it out. But what we've done over the years is we've created some very detailed maintenance specifications that if you fall into this silver level, which a lot of our public golf courses are, that if the superintendent goes through and knocks all these things out, you're hitting our segmentation standards. And if a general manager or somebody else comes in and says, hey, you ought to be doing this and this and this and this, and I want my fairways mode five times a week, it's like, hey, that's not part of our standards. It would be nice, but if you want to go ahead and go up, it's got to be a return on that investment and make sure that we're not over-maintaining for that price point. And then I think most of our golfers are pretty understanding, and I think our properties are positioned correctly. Um, thank you, Scott. Another uh, question. Um, in regards to uh, trees being a big issue, um, falling under deferred maintenance, what are some strategies that you do to catch up on proper tree maintenance or trimming? Um, yeah, that's, that's a tough one. And unfortunately, out of all the things that have happened into this business, not American golf business, but the golf business in general, there's uh, with escalating costs and labor, minimum wage going up, price of water going through the roof, seeing huge increases, 3, 5, 10% a year. And if you have a $300,000 to $700,000 water budget with it going up 5%, you do the math. It becomes uh, it becomes more and more challenging to maintain, and that's why we've got to get more creative. But unfortunately, when it comes to tree trimming, we don't have that incorporated in on any of our maintenance budgets. It has to be run as a separate CapEx. And so we earmark a certain amount of money per property. Trees, they need to be trimmed at a certain frequency, and unfortunately, it is so cost prohibitive to go in and trim all the trees on a golf course or even be on a program, uh, it, uh, it seems to be like that's one of the items that normally gets pushed to the lower priority list with parking lots and parking lot resurfacing. We want to take care of the things that are really safety concerns, leaky roofs, uh, new carpeting in the clubhouses, making sure our bunkers have sand and our tee boxes are level. Those are the kind of things that seem to always get the CapEx dollars when we allocate them. And we do take care of some tree trimming, um, but not to the degree that I think everybody in this industry right now, almost everybody, unless you're at a really high-end equity club that has an unlimited budget, uh, they probably everybody wants more tree money. So to answer your question, I don't really have any great answers. The one thing that we do do, though, is we go out to competitive bid, and so we'll mark off a lot of trees. Some superintendents say, well, I'm going to go ahead and hire a guy to come in to do tree trimming, and he's going to charge me $1,200 a day for a truck, two ground two grounds crew, and a guy a climber. Well, how many trees can that guy actually trim? And that company can actually trim for $1,200 a day. I'd much rather flag the trees, bring in three to five companies, competitive bid it, and then just hold them to that number and find out who's really hungry at that point. And you can stretch the dollars far that way when you're going in and competitively bid any type of CapEx project. If the crew is really busy and you're doing bunkers, you're probably not going to get a very good price, but somebody might be slow. And the same thing happens with anything. I mean, that's just common sense. You're trying to keep your crews busy. But I found that there's varying, wide varying levels of prices when you uh, shop things out. And uh, final question, Do you, what are the, the, the one thing that you see consistent with successful superintendents across any uh, caliber of, of property? What's one trait that they all have that you've seen uh, in, your, in your time that uh, is consistent across every single successful superintendent? Um, I don't want to say passion, but some of the guys that work for us are our best superintendents. I don't even, I don't even know if they're just passionate what they do. They just, they're just damn good at it. They, they just put it all together, and they can prioritize things. I, um, God, I wish I had a snappy answer for you on that, but unfortunately, I, those, those building blocks, there seems to be common traits from the best superintendents we have that they have some of that. And if they've come to us and they've been successful in the past, they obviously don't have those exact seven, but they've done some variation of that to get them to where they are right now. 
uh, a lot of them are just hardworking guys. If you're going to be in this industry and you're expecting to get rich and work not that long or that many hours, you're probably in the wrong profession. This is a grinder of a job. And when you're out there, you're working during the summer and it's long hours and it's hot and people are taking shots at you. And it's, it is a tough, tough position that doesn't pay. There's not a lot of six figure jobs out there. So you got to love what you're doing and you got to love being out there outside and getting up early and going to bed early. Uh, it's, and when you're that superintendent, you always hear him talking about it when the sun's coming up and it's a nice morning that there's no better place you'd rather be than out on a golf course maintaining and managing it. So it's out of that passion and just appreciation of the environment that we get to work and um, just wanting to do the right thing. We're fortunate. We've got some incredible superintendents working with us. They wouldn't last very long if they if they didn't because we've, we've, we've got some extremely high standards and we, we've got some lean resources. So for you to be successful with us, you're uh, you're you're going to be an A player. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Bourgeois. I really appreciated your time and uh, presentation today. For all uh, the attendees on this morning's Catalyst webinar, as usual, the quiz will be going out here shortly, along with the link to the YouTube recording of this morning's presentation. Please take the quiz and return the quiz to Sharon Kirkman at PGAHQ.com. A score of 70% or higher will earn one MSR credit for uh, today's uh, presentation. I want to also uh, remind everybody that the next Catalyst webinar is on Thursday, May 11th with Zeb Wellborn, who will be, uh, he's a social media expert and uh, business operator. He will be uh, presenting on how to turn your golf course into a social golf course. So that's uh, going to be on May 11th. I want to thank everybody for their time this morning. Have a great day.